welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Carrie Cranston. Some of you know me. Um, I'm the president here of the American Writers Museum. Um, tonight is actually the third event in our Jean and John Rowe program series in conjunction with our new exhibit, My America, Immigrant and Refugee Writers Today. Um, so if you didn't get a chance, please take a look at that exhibit. There's over five hours of video content in there um, from 31 modern American writers. Um, but tonight, we get to present two renowned Chicago writers to talk about the connections between Chicago and Poland and the immigrant communities. Um, Dominic Pasiga is a professor at Columbia College teaching humanities, history, and the social sciences. He is Chicago's best historian, author of Chicago, a biography, and numerous other books about the city. He was raised on the South Side. He's worked in the stockyards and written about the immigrants and industrial workers who built the city from its trading post roots. His new book is American Warsaw, about Polish Chicago, which is also the backyard of Sarah Paretsky's legendary detective, V.I. Warszawski, who we were first introduced to in 1982 in Sarah's debut novel, Indemnity Only. Since that first book, Sarah's works have been translated into more than 30 languages. She's received numerous awards, including the Diamond Dagger for Lifetime Achievement from the British Crime Writers Association, the Gold Dagger for Best Novel for her book Blacklist, and a number of honorary degrees and doctors of letters from various universities. And in April 2020, V.I. Warszawski will be back on the case in her new book, Deadland. So, we are thrilled to have you both here tonight to talk about the history of Polish immigration in Chicago and its influence on the work you both do. So please help me in welcoming Sarah and Dominic. Thank you all for coming out. Am I on? Am I live? I met Dominic for the first time when in the centennial anniversary of the publication of The Jungle, which right. was 2006, Five roughly. Six, something yeah. like that, yeah. And yeah. Uh, BBC television came over to do a documentary on the stockyards, back of the yards, and what has happened to the stockyards. And Dominic, of course, was their expert. And I have no idea why they asked me to come along, except it was about as cold that day it was, as yes. it is today. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. We got to stand while they were fascinated with this enormously long freight train, yeah. and we had to stand <laughs> while they photographed, filmed it. And I was like, yeah. please, guys, have you never seen a train before? Um, so when, uh, they asked, when the museum asked me to come here and, and speak with Dominic about his new book, of, of course I said yes, because if you want to know about Chicago history, and especially immigrant history in Chicago, and even more especially labor in Chicago, then Dominic is the expert. And um, there is really no one who's his equal in covering those subjects. I um, read the book with a lot of interest, but I thought we'd start with um, the phrase which I, the expression which I didn't know because I'm really, I am pretty ignorant about many things including Poland and Poles outside of Poland, despite being a Peretsky who's written about Warshawski. Um, so why don't you start by explaining what Polonia is, because that's the, sure. kind of the crux of the book. Sure. You know, Polonia is the diaspora community. It's basically the immigrant community here in Chicago, but across the country as well. And we call it Polonia. Polonia is Poland in Latin. And so Polonia is the uh, diaspora. Those who are in the 19th century, early and before World War I, we called ourselves the Fort Partition. Uh, Poland was divided by the three empires, uh, Russia, Austria, Hungary, and Germany, uh, after uh, the 18th century. And it disappeared from the map of Poland. And the immigration which took place was referred to as the Fort Partition, the partition that might help the three partitions regain their independence. And you, I didn't have time to go over this in detail before we started, but I had asked if Dominic would bring maps to show both. They're, they're in the book, so if you've bought the book, you're in luck. You'll see many maps showing the migration of Poles through the city and then mm -hmm. into the suburbs. But do you have them in presentable form? I think so. Let me... Because uh... Uh, I also thought it would be helpful for people to see what we're talking about with the partition in Europe and where people were coming from. Uh, okay, so can you see that? It's, it's, this is the first map. This is the five original 
Polish neighborhoods in Chicago. So the first one, uh, I don't know if this, does this have a one of those, uh, no, I just shut it off, okay. It doesn't seem to have a, a laser. Okay, so the first one is up in Milwaukee Division in Ashland. We sometimes call it Polish downtown. Uh, Poles call it Stanisławowo Trojcowo. That's after the two parishes that are important there. Then you come down to the west side, and that was Wojciechowa, or St. Adelbert's Parish. And then down into Bridgeport, where you had St. Mary of Perpetual Help. And you notice we named the neighborhoods after the parishes, right? And St. Barbara's. Then, where I'm from, the back of the yards. We had three Polish parishes, St. Joseph's, St. John of God, Sacred Heart. And then, South Chicago, uh, where, which uh, had four Polish parishes, uh, St. Bronisława, St. Michael, St. Mary Magdalene, and Immaculate Conception, which was the first one. So those were the first five Polish neighborhoods, and they're on this map uh, here. And so, where, where did they go? They went where there was jobs. Uh, that's what immigrants do and the lowest paying jobs in the bottom of the ladder. In the stockyards, they stood in, up in their ankles in blood, pushing, uh, they were called squeegee men, and they pushed blood into the gutters all day, or they, or they grabbed the hind legs of hogs and they shackled them and lifted the hogs up into the air, and they made 14 and a half cents an hour. I was trying to rem I got the numbers from you, and I'm not sh back when we did the Upton Sinclair uh, tour, and I, I, stole those for VI's grandparents who were Polish immigrants. And that they made $11 a week, I Something assume. Something like that, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And um, it was not fun work, which. And then do you have a map of the partition in? I don't. I didn't okay. bring a map of okay. the partition. But the partitions were the, the Russian section took the center of Poland and eastern Poland. Galicia in the south went to Austria-Hungary. And in the northwest, uh, up to the Baltic, or went to Germany. Yeah. And what kept Polish alive as a language during the partition? Because I know anecdotally from, from friends whose uh, grandparents might have been born during the partition that their birth certificates were in Russian or German. They mm -hmm. weren't in Polish. Right. Yeah, well, I, I think very much, I mean, Poles were very dedicated to their language and the maintenance of language. In, in, uh, there were school strikes in the German-occupied part of Poland uh, because the Germans, uh, uh, for instance, passed a law, and think about this, they passed a law that you had to confess your sins in German. Okay? And in Russia, uh, in, in the Russian partition, Polish was not taught in the schools. There was Russian was taught in the schools. The Austro-Hungarian partition was a very liberal. Uh, which is not the image of Austria-Hungary mm -hmm. that's usually around. But very liberal. The Poles were allowed to teach Polish. They were allowed to run their universities. They basically ran Galicia. Uh, and so this became the hotbed of Polish nationalism in Galicia, especially in, a, in two cities, Kraków and in Lvov, which is now called Lviv. It's now in uh, the Ukraine. But in the 19th century, the 18th, 19th century, it was a very Polish and Jewish city. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was the hotbed of, uh, of Polish nationalism. They are the, the intellectuals in Lvov were the first ones to call the immigration the Fort Partition. Mm -hmm. And they reached out to Chicago, as, as I talk about it in the book. Yeah. One of, one of the many interesting things, but one of the interesting things in the early section of the book has to do with who, who well, not we'll get to who got to be a Pole and how they chose mm -hmm. that, but... Initially, the landed gentry were opposed to... Peasants. Uh, right. Yeah. Peasants were not Poles. Peasants were just sort of under people. The gentry were the real Poles. And so, and so mind you, the, the migration was primarily, like my grandfather and grandmother, Polish peasants, right? But after about 1863, 1865, after two revolutions had, been, had failed terribly in Poland, and had been defeated by the Russians, the intellectuals began to look, so, and so this, you have this huopomania, which means peasant mania, going on. And uh, it's actually quite interesting because the intellectuals then find what they call the soul of Poland. And the soul of Poland is in the people, in the farms, in the big villages, and so forth. And then they get swept up in this nationalism. You know, nationalism comes about after the French Revolution. Uh, you know, before that, Poland is a very multi-ethnic state, by the way. I think we should probably mention that. Jews, Poles, Armenians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, Ukrainians, 
Germans, Czechs, Slovaks are all part of the Polish crown. And then, who's Polish? And that becomes a big question. That divides the country and it divides Chicago. I'm, uh, I'm going to hijack the discussion a little bit to my personal experience because I've been on both sides of who's, the, who's a poll mm -hmm. question here. My first paying job in the city, I was a secretary in the political science department at the University of Chicago, and kids would come in wanting me to waive late fees or get them into closed classes, and when I would say <laughs> no, they would say, you're a traitor to the Polish-American kids. Right. That you, they would say, you're a traitor to the Polish nation, and I was like, I'm just the secretary. I'm not <laughs> grand enough to betray an entire country. And then on the other side of it was when um, Disney was getting ready to make a movie allegedly based on my character. Um, and uh, a local Polish-American politician tried to lobby Disney not to make Mm -hmm. the movie because Warshawski is a Jewish name, not a Polish name, right. and that I was defaming the Polish nation by... So I think my own history kind of encapsulates sure. how... Um, you know, I mean, there's a wonderful Yiddish word. It's a mishigas. Uh -huh. It's a mess, you know. Uh, and, and, and But the idea of who's a Pole, that's mm -hmm. very important. So, you know, for the Polish Roman Catholic Union, you had to be Catholic and you had to speak Polish. For the Polish National Alliance, you had to believe in Poland. So the, the emblem of the Polish National Alliance is the Polish eagle, the Ukrainian uh, uh, archangel, and the Lithuanian horseman. And, mm. and uh, Jews were often vice presidents of the association. Oh, it's, really? Yeah, huh. yeah. So, you know, the whole idea was, if you believe in Poland, you're a Pole. Uh -huh. You might be of Armenian descent, I don't care. You believe in Poland, you're a Pole. It went back to this old pre-nationalistic idea. So this was a big discussion. I mean, priests got beat up over this in the, in the Polish downtown area. There were generally, there were, and this eventually led to the creation of the Polish National Catholic Church and, and other things like that. Uh, you know, and so Polish Jews and Polish Christians didn't begin to pull away from each other in the United States. But it was very, very much a, one of the founders of the Polish American Congress was a Polish Jewish journalist. He believed in Poland. And this is in 1944, wow. 44, yeah. And so it's, it's really kind of interesting to see how this argument goes. Who's a Pole? And that's the one thing we like to argue about in the community. I, I grew up in the community. We like to argue, we like, there's two things we really enjoy. Parades. <laughs> we love parades. And we love to argue with each other about who's a better Pole. <laughs> Those are the two arguments we have, the two things we like to do. And, and so uh, what and do you have to do to be a better pole? I personally just shut up and be quiet as much as I can because, you know, I, you know I'll get uh, crucified. But it, it's, it's really kind of interesting. Uh, y y you know, first of all, my family's from the mountains, so uh -huh. we're, we're Gorala. So um, I was, uh, my grandmother used to say to me, never date a north side Polish girl. <laughs> and I say, Babka, why? Well, because they're Germans and Russians, they're not really Polish. <laughs> Only South Side Poles are really Poles because they all come from our part of Poland. That's where most of the mountaineers were on the South Side. And then she said to me, she said, but you know what? If you want to marry somebody, you could also marry a Slovak. They're just like us. <laughs> okay, I, I just have to put you on the spot and ask you for the ethnic origins of your wife. Uh, she's Sicilian. I wait. <laughs> I waited till Grandma died. <laughs> I was pretty old by the time I got married, but I was 34, you know. But I waited till Babka went away. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, you mentioning that your wife is Sicilian leads me to another question that I was in my mind when I was reading the book. You talk about some of the divisiveness having to do with with the partitions and with people feeling mm -hmm. that they that they couldn't really claim a country in the way, say, even though the Irish were under occupation, mm -hmm. they could claim the country sure. of Ireland. It was defined. And I mean, Italy was also under occupation, and there were a lot of different languages. But do you think the Italian immigrant experience 
was markedly different from the Polish immigrant experience? I, I think that all immigrant experiences are very similar. Uh -huh. And you know, and this is why I wonder now today why people who came here in the, in the teens and before, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and their grandchildren are now alive today and are anti-immigrant. And I'm thinking like, do you realize what we went through in the 1920s where they finally cut immigration off from Poland? Mm -hmm. So Poles, Jews, Lithuanians, Latvians, Ukrainians, Greeks, Italians couldn't come into the country because we were so different. Now, you know, if you look at our names, there's what, two vowels and 17 consonants or something, you know? <laughs> It's, it's incredible, you can't pronounce them. Uh, and, and we speak a, a language that's not a romance language, right? We, we talk a Slavic language. And even worse, when we came here, we prayed in Latin. So we were really mixed up. And, uh, and so we were seen as too un-American. And it was really a tremendous amount of prejudice against Poles. And still, even in the 60s and 70s, you know, the Polak jokes and things like that, and dumb Polak and all this kind of stuff, in my neighborhood, I knew who I was. When I went out of the neighborhood, people would say things to me, you know? And I'd say, who are you, you know? Uh, but uh, it, it, was, it was kind of interesting to see this kind of image now portrayed on other groups. And you don't, and I, I, I remember having an argument with a family member who now lives in California. She'll probably fall into the sea. Uh, <laughs> but, and saying, you know, if, 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 people treated grandma like you're treating people right now, you wouldn't be here because your mother would never have married, you know, your father, et cetera, like that. And I just think that, so it, it bothers me. That, that's one thing that I hope people get from this book, that all these groups go through. I mean, obviously we don't go through the kind of things that racism brings upon people. I mean, that's, that's uh, 10 times worse. But we all go through this. We're all American. I mean, Franklin Roosevelt once uh, spoke to the Daughters of the Re American Revolution, and he said, my fellow immigrants. I mean, wow, my fellow immigrants. Roosevelt, you know, uh, whose family came like 1672 or something like that on a Dutch boat, you know, uh, my fellow immigrants. And uh, he shocked them because they didn't think they were immigrants. My daughter once won an uh, award for writing from the Daughters of the American Revolution. Did she really? Yeah. Well, and they came up to me and says, oh, how far back does your family go? I said 47th Street. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. So, yeah, just to reinforce what Dominic just said, the first kind of, I mean, there had been laws restricting um, Chinese and Japanese immigration into the country going back to the 19th century, but the first really big formal anti-immigration bill in 1924, I believe it was, specifically referred to Jews, people from Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. and Greeks mm -hmm. as being diseased right. and destroying the character of the American nation. And so when you have this bloodbath going on in Poland, which was really where the most brutal fighting or yeah. occupation of the Second World War took place, um, those people had no place to go because we had just slammed that door shut. Yeah. Twenty percent of the Polish population died during World War II, one out of every five. It was the first country to fight and was the longest occupied country, you know. And then you had the displaced persons, which I talk about in the, in the, in the book, displaced persons. There was this new migration. You know, it's now, so I, there's three major migrations we call Zachlebem, which is by bread, it's an economic migration, mm -hmm. then the displaced persons, and later the solidarity. But you know, and this happens, by the way, every immigrant group, those that are settled longer, the new guys come in, clash right away, you know. So the, the uh, displaced persons would come in and they'd say, oh, you, you don't speak good Polish, you, don't, you know. You know, you know. And uh, the, the American Poles would say, well, well you know, I, uh, yes we do. And they'd say, no, no, and, and they, they would break, I and mean, the Polish organizations in the 40s and 50s were split between these two groups. There were very big, big arguments between them. So then, by the 70s and 80s, by the 80s and 90s, most of the people that were leading these organizations, many of them high up were displaced, former displaced persons. In came the solidarity migration, and well, you're not a real Pole because you were raised under communism. No, you're not a real Pole because you don't know how to talk anymore, right? I always tell people, I don't speak Polish, I speak po I speak in the Chicago manner, you know. 
Uh, there was once, a, I was at a nightclub on Milwaukee Avenue, I forget the name of it, I think Marilla, I think it was, and they had a band that sang a song called Muviem Poshik Agosku. And it was so funny because they took all these English words and they put a Polish ending on it, you know. And so, you know, so one of, one of the, one of the, one of the uh, verses said, I'll meet you at Goldblatt's on the corner. Ja tam bedem w Goldblatu na konerze. Well, you know, in Polish, it makes no sense at all. But in Chicago school, it makes perfect sense. I'll meet you by Goldblatt's, you know. <laughs> Now, the question just went totally out of my head. Why don't you keep talking? And I'll, I'll reorganize my brain. Um, one of the things that Dominic touches on in the books, which came as a surprise to me, I don't know why, was uh, Polish street gangs in the um, 30s and 40s, mm -hmm. uh, which you just don't hear about, don't think about. And of course, it's totally understandable with a population that's living in poverty and in kind of cramped together conditions. I was fascinated by the program that was put together between the University of Chicago and St. Michael's, sure. and I wonder if you could just talk about that. Yeah, in the 1930s, uh, W.I. Burgess, the famous sociologist, mm -hmm. and, and not W.I., Ernest Burgess, right, W.I. Thomas, Ernest Burgess, the Chicago School of Sociology decided that they wanted to deal with the issue of juvenile delinquency. And there was actually a book called, uh, you know, The Gang, and they interviewed 1,300 gangs in Chicago. Most of them were Polish, which is interesting because most Poles think we never had gangs. You know, we were always upstanding citizens. There were plenty of gangs. I grew up in back of the yards. Let me tell you, there were plenty of gangs in back of the yards that were Polish, even in the 60s and 70s, but in the 50s, the 60s and 70s. And uh, Burgess and uh, sent these people down to South Chicago to study the Bush, which was this notorious neighborhood next to the steel mills, you know. And it was a poor neighborhood. Anybody from the Bush? Anybody from South Chicago? Uh, and uh, VI is. VI, that's right, VI, that's right, that's right. 90th and yeah. Houston. Yeah, and 90th and Houston was the toughest part of town. And uh, it was, uh, you know, so St. Michael's was there and uh, the university sociologists came down and they first made uh, 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 an alliance with the settlement houses. There were two Protestant settlement houses in the neighborhood. Uh, and the priest, of course, I, I, I don't know about your priest, but my priest always said you can't go to the settlement house because they were going to convert you to Protestantism, right? So these kids couldn't go to the settlement house because, you know, the priest said you can't. So he find, they finally realized that, you know, it was the Catholic Church that was the organized organization in the neighborhood. And they made this deal with St. Michael's and they created the Russell Square Community Committee, which was one of the most successful neighborhood organizations, that in the back of the yards neighborhood council. Uh, and then later on the Northwest side, uh, the uh, Nor uh, Northwest Alliance or something like that. So it, it, uh, it really proved to be a very important way of, um, what's the term, empowering, mm -hmm. right, local people. And Steve Bubach was the organizer. He was a gang leader. And they made him a social worker. And he got all these kids off the street and playing softball and, you know, getting good jobs and changing the neighborhood. Uh, it was a really important organization, yeah. I guess in, in reading that section and in listening to you talk about it, I would love it if there were a way to translate that to the current poverty gang activity mm -hmm. and so on in South Chicago, well, in throughout the south side of the city. And yeah. I don't know if we lack the will, if the issues are so very different today. Um, I think... Drugs and guns have made a big difference. These kids didn't have guns or drugs, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, what they did was petty ta theft, mm -hmm. what we would think of now as petty theft, or, you know, gang fights were, you know, bats, mm -hmm. chains, not with M16s. Mm -hmm. um, in my neighborhood where I grew up in back of the yards, there was a, a gang called the Saints. And I'll tell you why they were called the Saints. Most of them were altar boys. So that's why they were called the saints. They're now called the Latin saints. And it's a really tough gang in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But originally, they were basically Polish kids. Mm -hmm. And then over time, they let Mexicans in, and they became the Latin saints. But I'll, so, so when I was a kid, when I, you know, there used to be 10.30 p.m. Uh, curfew. curfew. 
you were under 16, I think it was, right? Mm -hmm. So I might have been 15 or 14, and it was 10.25, and I had to get home because the cops would bust us. And I'm walking as fast as I can down the street, and three guys get out of a gangway in front of me with baseball bats. So I'm not stupid. I turn around and walk the other way, except three other guys get out with baseball bats. And I said to myself, gee, Dominic, you sure was nice being alive. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. And there's this guy, and you know how the two flats with the steps going up mm -hmm. to the second floor? He's standing on the top of the sec second floor there, and he's looking at me, and he glitz out this whistle, and he yells out in Polish, it's only Dominic, let him go. Now, I was friends with the Polish immigrant kids, and I was friends with the Polish-American kids. And the Polish-American kids and the Polish-immigrant kids would fight each other. Uh. And, but I was friends with both of them. And so uh, Moskva was his name. And he called me over and he says, what are you doing? Go home. It's time to go home. I said, yes, sir. And I just ran down the street. <laughs> I wanted to get away from those baseball bats as fast as I could. But I think there was always, there was always get, the rebels. I write about the rebels in the book, too. And that in the 1950s, this was a big issue in the back of the yards. They killed a black kid. Um, and uh, a lot of them went to jail, and it was, uh, and I knew some of the rebels' younger brothers and sisters. You know, they were older kids, uh, and uh, so, you know, when we think about crime as being somebody else's problem, or we think about, you know, oh, we were always better than these people, or whatever, we never did that kind of stuff. I'm going to quote one of my favorite politicians: "A lot of malarkey." <laughs> Because we all, we all did the same thing. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I did, sorry, thinking of one of my uncles whose parents were uh, uncle by marriage, whose parents, as all the many of the Jews in New York from Eastern Europe were in the garment industry, and his father was an itinerant uh, tailor, carried his sewing machine mm -hmm. door to door. And w w there was a family discussion, as with your cousin in California, sure. on how these people are just animals. And, right. And so Abe said, and my father had to walk in the street because people were just pouring their slop buckets sure. down yeah. from yeah. the... <laughs> yeah. and he got his sewing machine hit once, and that was... <laughs> and that was <laughs> the end of that. Yeah. Enough to convince him to walk in the street and not on the sidewalk. Yeah. <sighs> um, okay. So how does the greater Chicagoland Polonia feel? You talk a lot about how immigration has, has trickled, has come, has dwindled to, oh, yeah. I have become a phasic, uh, that it, the river has become a trickle. Mm -hmm. And so most of Polish identified people in Chicago are at least second generation, not First. There's still a good deal of immigrants, but a lot have gone back, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, the, and the incoming has slowed down. And, and why have they slowed down? Well, Poland is now a normal country. Mm -hmm. It's a member of the EU. It's a member of NATO. There are 16 buses a day from, from Poznań to Brussels. So why come here to work when you've got to get a visa and you can only get a vacation visa? By the way, there were some people working on my house, and I have all these Polish mountaineers that work on my house whenever I need something. They're all from, you know, they call me Rodak, which means, you know, countrymen. And um, I said, Yusef, how long have you been on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me and he says, 25 years. <laughs> He says, I have a house in justice. I sent my two kids to college. I've been on vacation. For, because people blend in, mm -hmm. blend into the whole, you know, uh, uh, society. But, but that has changed now because, once again, you don't need to pay a lot of money, wait for years to get a visa to get here. Um, you know, uh, you can go to Brussels. I was in Italy. Now, think about this. I'm in a piazza, right? I'm having a glass of wine. Uh, it's a beautiful, sunny day in Sicily. My wife is Sicilian, and I'm sitting there by myself having a breakfast wine. That sounds bad. Uh, I think it sounds delicious. It, it, it was, by the way. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I hear Polish all around me. Everybody sitting around me was Polish having a breakfast wine with me. You know? <laughs> and it was just amazing to me. And I asked one Italian, he says, yeah, there's about 50,000 Poles in Sicily. 50,000 Poles in Sicily, who would have guessed? Do you know what the 
in Ireland, there was, they just did a, uh, a census. Uh, they, what, is your, what is the language you speak at home the most? First is English, of course. Second is Polish. Third is Gaelic. It's number three behind Polish. Hmm. And the largest immigrant group in Norway are Poles. Hmm. The largest immigrant group in London are Poles. I think I think we're hearing some deep state secrets here. Yes, about absolutely. Who's taking over the world. We are. We're slowly taking over the world. Scratch anybody. Forget can... Zelensky and. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, they were once ours, but never mind. We'll talk to them. <laughs> so part of of what you detail in the book is the support that. Um, that Zachlem, in particular, mm -hmm. polls are giving to people back in the homeland. Now yeah. I'm wondering how much financial support is coming the other way. Um, that that I, I, I don't think there's much financial support coming the other way, but there's certainly poll, polls in Chicago sending money back to Poland. You know, in the 19th century, Galicia, where mm -hmm. part of your family's from, I right. believe, yeah, uh -huh. and my family's from, was totally dependent on the U.S. dollar in the 19th century, by 1890, because there was so much money being sent back from Chicago and Buffalo and Detroit and Cleveland. You know, people would, and, and I'm not just talking about money being shifted by, uh, you know, cable, but you put something in the envelope, right? Mm -hmm. And you send it back every week, $5, $2, $3. The Galicia was totally dependent on American money. And it was just kind of amazing. And to an extent, uh, that was true well through the communist years, you know. So please uh, keep that in mind, too, the next time yeah. someone says something ugly about Mexicans in the yeah. state sending money back to Mexico. Yeah. This is a longstanding, not tradition, but means of support and survival sure. globally. But uh, in a lighter, somewhat lighter uh, look at that, you talk about the way in which Poles moved from the city into the suburbs. Mm -hmm. How how strong a connection is there emotionally, really, would you say, to Poland now among Polish Chicagoans, as opposed to, you know, a sentimental yeah. connection maybe, um, but how... Well, I, I think, you know, I mean, remember, Poles have been in Chicago for three, four, five generations. And I think the, the generations that are closest to the immigration are more, of course, attached. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm third generation. I go to Poland almost every year. Um, I speak Polish. Well, I speak Poshika Gosku. I speak the, the Chicago dialect. Uh, Do you have dual citizenship? No, I don't. Because uh -huh. my parents, uh, grandparents came before 1918, uh, and so it's more difficult for me to get dual right. citizenship. No, I know that. I just yeah, thought yeah. maybe. But after, after 1918, 1919, you can get dual citizenship mm -hmm. pretty easily. But, but it's harder for me. But no, I don't. Um, but I, so I have, you know, well, it depends on how you grow up, right? I mean, this is, a, I mean, some people, when they come here, they don't want their kids to learn English at all. Right? Mm. I mean, they don't want their kids to learn Polish at all, just learn English. I mean, I think that's the experience of a lot of people, uh, not only in our community, but in the Hispanic community and every other community. You know, you've got to learn English because you're in America now. Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I grew up uh, speaking Polish because my grandmother wouldn't, she was here 56 years and never spoke English. Don't say anything about her in English because she understood. <laughs> and then you got hit with those of you who know Polish, with a pomivats right across your face. It was a dish rag, you know. Um, but, uh, you know. Uh, and there it, were Polish language newspapers. I don't oh, yeah. think you oh, talked about, yes. yeah. well, you mentioned some of yeah. the articles in yeah. them, but. I think there were like five dailies even in the 70s. Even, well, into the 70s, there were probably two big ones, the Chicagoski and the Jennings Vinskova. Now only one is left. But previous to that, there were 14 or 15. Because, you know, put two poles on an island, you get 10 newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I